All right, environmental science students, this is going to be chapter nine um, in our uh, sustaining biodiversity unit. So uh, the case study is about the polar bears. And uh, the main thing I want to say here is that the reduction of the polar bear population is primarily due to this loss of sea ice. And so we see um, uh, that a reduction in the amount of sea ice in the, in the summertime because of the warming temperatures. And the warming temperatures that we're seeing uh, are increasing at a greater rate in the Arctic than they are along the equator. And so while we may not see a huge difference in the amount of um, weather and climate uh, where we're at at the Arctic, it's, it's significantly more. Section one is about the role that humans play in the extinction of animals. And we talk uh, briefly about the extinction rates and things like that first. So we first have three different kinds of extinction, and actually we're going to break that down even further, I think, here in a little bit. We have local, e ecological, and bio uh, biological, but we have then um, first initially the biological extinction, which is that uh, that's con that's what's completely gone. That's extinct is forever. That's no more. Background extin extinction is the normal rate of extinction that occurs. Because we have to understand, or have to make sure that we understand, that extinction is a natural process. It's just whether or not that natural process is happening at an accelerated rate due to uh, human activities. The extinction rate, then, is how many species are going extinct per year. And then based on that extinction rate, we can extrapolate how much, uh, how fast species are going to be ex going extinct over the, the next 100 years, uh, for example. Uh, in the past, we have had mass extinctions, and there have been uh, approximately five events, five mass extinction events. Uh, most biologists agree on that number, um, and right now a lot of biologists say that we are currently in the sixth mass extinction. They say that because of these human activities that we uh, are, are engaging in, the species extinction rate is high enough to qualify for uh, an extinction event. And... Um, we won't see the evidence of this until a um, hundred, a couple hundred years. Um, those are the natural ways that things have happened, mass extinctions have had in the past. Uh, the different types, so local extinction is where we have a species that would normally be in an area that is extinct in that area, but um, we see it in other areas still uh, not flourishing, but um, still surviving. Ecological extinction is where that species is extinct, um, or excuse me, almost extinct in that area, um, in that um, that environment. But there still is a small population there. The problem is that it is in such a low population, it no longer interacts to any kind of extent uh, in that area that is worth um, worth discussing. Uh, then we have biological extinction, which is the end. Human activities, these are the types of things that we do. We fill in wetlands, and that's a, that's a big one. We see wetlands a lot of times as useless land, and so we fill them in so that we can use them for agriculture. We convert grasslands and forests into crop fields, and especially prairies here in Iowa. 99.99% uh, .99 of the prairies, the natural prairies that used to be here is extinct. And so there is a, literally an untold number of species, especially plant and insect species that used to live here that we uh, have no information about. They're, they're just gone and before we even uh, knew them or were able to research them. And it's for this cropland. Also, we have urban or suburban sprawl. And we see this happening in Grimes here right now in 2017, where uh, there is a huge amount of our cropland being converted into uh, housing developments. We have then other, other types of pollution, whether it's water pollution, air pollution, or anything, just the, the overall pollution statement. We have the extinction rate, so we see that somewhere between 100 and the book says 100 to 1,000 times larger than typical background extinction state. And I have used this number in the past, this 10,000 times, and this is what it could grow to the end of the century. So right now it's 100 to 1,000. It could go up to a 10,000 uh, times the background extinction rate. And um, this rate, so the rate of extinction could increase 1% per year throughout this next century, which means that we could lose one half to one quarter of the world's plant and animal species uh, in existence, which is 
very, very significant. Uh, there's a, a quote in the book that says, within just a few human generations, we shall, in the absence of greatly expanded conservation efforts, impoverish, impoverish the biosphere to an extent that it will persist for at least 200,000 human generation or 20 times longer than what we have been on this planet. So uh, significant issues here that could be happening in the next 100 years. Um, and this is a conservative uh, extinction estimate and the extinction, so the, because of that, we can say with some certainty that the extinction rates will rise without significant conservation efforts. And these are the reasons why. Uh, the population is increasing. Uh, we have a higher amount of endangered species. Uh, tropical forests and other places are being destroyed for our growing population. And uh, this leads to what's called the speciation, speciation cross, crisis. So we have extinction, but we also have speciation. So if you think about extinction being the end of a species, speciation is the beginning of a species. So those two things are going back and forth, and both of them are natural processes. It's just whether or not humans are um, impacting the extinction rate to an extent that uh, is significantly larger than um, what we see at a normal level, uh, which would be here. And, and we have a lot of evidence to prove that that is, that, that is the case. All right. Um, these are the reasons why endangered species are endangered. Uh, a lot of times they're big, they're slow, they're tasty, they have valuable parts, or they have behaviors that make them easy to kill. And this this bottom one here is is probably pretty significant in terms of that. Because when we uh, set out to develop Iowa and the surrounding states in uh, the heartland of the United States into uh, agricultural agricultural areas, we didn't set out to fo set, set out to um, cause plants and animals to go to extinct. It's just that this is where they live, and this is where we um, uh, went to, to farm. And so we have this issue of um, just them being in this area and existing, and um, that made them easy to kill because we needed the land for to farm, and so we didn't have any any reason to set out to kill them. It just was a natural byproduct of our actions to be able to feed the growing population. So there you go. But we had the other parts here, valuable parts like poaching and stuff like that. All right, we have. Um, other these are these are species that are threatened to extinction. So we have uh, let's see here. Goodness. Um, the Sumatran tiger, less than sixty in existence. We have the Mexican wolf, uh, which is has a. Fewer than 60 in existence. We have the uh, California condor, which we have 172 in the southwest United States, and the whooping crane, which is 210. And these are all numbers from uh, many years ago, so 2010, 2011, something like that, uh, 2009. All right, so here are some different characteristics and examples of uh, why species tend to go extinct. So there are some. Uh, we see that in the realm of extinction, we have a lot more plant species going extinct than other species. Um, yeah, so this is the, the percentage of species threatened to prim premier, premature extinction. Uh, the, the passenger pigeon is a case study here I wanted to talk for just a few minutes because it's, it's really pretty impressive. The passenger pigeons were... Um, species of pigeon that exist in the United States until about the early 1900s and uh, they were numbered in the, the billions and there was one one uh, particular individual who saw a uh, flock of these pigeons fly over where he was at this is John Audubon um, that took it was so huge that it darkened the sky above him and it took three days to fly over just 
to migrate over where he was. So huge, huge. And within less than 100 years, the hunting of this pigeon led them to extinction. And a lot of it has to do with that, that commercial hunting there. And they were very easy to kill. And so this is where that, that term stool pigeon came from. They would take a pigeon and, and tie it to a stool out in the middle of a field. And then uh, based on their natural flocking instinct, pigeons would come and hang out in that area with that pigeon. And uh, once there would be thousands of them in one location, uh, they would take huge nets and just net them all together and, um, and grab them all at the same time. All right, so there's the passenger pigeon. So the second section here is why should we care? And some really big reasons here is that we have these ecological and uh, env economic services that they provide. And especially if we think about trees and plants and things like that, the purification of air and the purification of water. So a, a really big deal. And it, it's important to note that a lot of these services that species do provide for us, we, we could probably do a lot of them without them. Like uh, we could pollinate using technology, but whatever we do in place of those things will cost money where right now this kind of stuff happens for free. And so that's a, that's a big, big part of this. That Why do we want to um, develop technology to do things that we already have in existence that does them for free? So uh, these are the reasons to prevent extinction, natural resources and natural services, economic and uh, economic services, the ecotourism is a big thing. In Costa Rica, they have uh, put away many uh, a large percentage of that country into reserves because of this. So they found economic economic development this way, um, as opposed to uh, going out and hunting them and things like that. All right, there we go. Uh, different services that different species of plants have provided for us. So this is a lot of different research that has happened. All right. Uh, ecotourism. This is a macaw. All right. How do humans accelerate the species species extinction? And this is that acronym that we uh, will go over in class, the HIPCO. And this is not only really important in terms of the different ways that humans uh, increase premature extinction, but it also is a convenient way to remember it. Uh, and the other part is that it's, it's in order. So habitat destruction and fragmentation is the one that threatens species the most, wherever overexploitation is the least. So it's in order of um, its impact. All right, so here's habitat fragmentation or habitat destruction. These are the different problems that come up after that species or after that area is fragmented and some things that are being done. So national parks and national reserves act as these habitat islands. And so these habitat islands are places where um, species can survive. Now there's some problems with this, um, primarily because these islands don't have borders that the uh, species understand. And so while wolves may be protected in, say, Yellowstone National Park, if that same pack of wolves leaves the national park, I mean, they don't understand that they're leaving the national park, but then they become subject to hunters and other um, conditions that could lead to their death. Uh, so one of the things they're working on is developing these um, uh, habitat corridors that connect these two places, uh, like national parks and national parks or different habitat islands or nature, nature reserves that would act as kind of a natural place for these uh, species to migrate from place to place. All right. So here's some examples of uh, species that have lost their habitats and or have had a significant reduction of their range. So here is the Indian tiger. Uh, the blue is where they used to uh, roam and the red is where they are today. 
There's the elephant. Asian elephant. Africans have big ears. Asians have small ears for the elephant type. All right, uh, invasive species is the next part. That's the I. Um, and a lot of times these invasive species are introduced uh, deliberately. And the reason is for a lot of a lot of things. We could need them for food. For example, corn and rice and all that kind of stuff uh, can be grown in environments where they aren't native to. A shelter, medicine, just because they look pretty. Um, and this is a lot of what's going on with aquariums or like the Burmese python in Florida, uh, the lionfish in the, the Caribbean, all of these um, thing, all those species were introduced into those areas because they're acidic enjoyment and then dumped into the wild where they were able to reproduce uh, without any kind of predators or competition. All right, so these are the deliberately introduced species. More, and then we have accidentally delivered or accidentally introduced species. So, all right, the kudzu vines is really a pretty important case study. It was imported from Japan, like it says here, in the 1930s, and uh, it can it it just grows out of control in that area. The in the south, I think southeastern United States, it grows very very well. Um, that was originally imported because of its ability to control erosion, which it does very, very well, but it also um, was not controlled by any kind of natural predators there in, in the south. Uh, however, we are finding that there is significant benefits to the kudzu. kudzu. It can be used for making paper and actually like better quality paper than what we uh, use, we can make out of trees. Um, it also is uh, can be used as a uh, alcohol source. It calls, it's also edible, uh, so it's a lot of lot of different uses for this vine. So, here is uh, what the kudzu vine looks like, and then we have the uh, accidentally introduced species. So, the fire ant in the 1930s, the Burm Burmese python, and the Florida Everglades. Everglades. So examples there. Oh yeah, this is a fight between a python and an alligator. The biggest part to prevent or reduce invasive species or to deal with invasive species is to prevent them from happening in the first place. And so um, that's a big theme throughout the entire unit is that if we can prevent them from becoming established, that's better than having to deal with things afterwards, uh, whether that has to do with prevention of pollution uh, and the cleanup that ha happens after that or the prevention of invasive species. All right. Uh, here are the other parts of HIPCO, human population growth. And so there isn't any additional slides specifically on this. So let me just talk about this a little bit. That uh, it's not necessarily the amount of people on this planet that's a problem. It is more so the uh, amount of stuff that we consume. And so like China has a, a huge population, you know, a couple billion people. What's happening now is that there is a large progression of those individuals going from um, lower class, you know, very, very poor poverty to a middle class. And once you have more money, you consume more goods. And uh, that can have a huge impact on um, the environment and ecosystem. So there's the overconsumption part as well. They kind of go together but not necessarily. So more people, more places to live, more things to consume. Also, better uh, lifestyles lead to overconsumption. And then we have pollution and climate change. So we'll, we'll just look at some specific stuff related to that. Uh, we have DDT as a pollution that the book specifically talks about. And DDT was is a pesticide, and it was banned in the United States in 1972. It's, it's important to note that DDT does exist still in some other areas, but um, for the most part, it's banned worldwide. And this brings up a really important uh, concept of bioaccumulation bio and biomagn biomagnification, sorry, um, and something that we don't focus on a lot in the year. So uh, this, is, this is, I think, the only time that it comes up. And it happens when certain poisons are fat-soluble. 
So if you have a poison that is water soluble, it goes into your blood system, it, it does what it does, and if you survive it, or if it doesn't cause any significant problems, you just, or if it's in low, low enough quantity that it doesn't hurt you, you just, um, you excrete it out through your urine. However, if it's fat soluble, it stays in those fat cells, and they can be passed up the food chain. And so if we see uh, DDT, which is fat soluble um, in plankton, um, it is in a very small concentration, not nearly enough to hurt someone, but as it goes up to the zooplankton, the minnows, then a different kind of fish, and then finally to the tertiary, or in this case, a quaternary predator, they have um, a very large amount of TDT that they're consuming to the point where uh, it will it will hurt them or their ability to reproduce. So that's what we saw um, in DDT. This is also why there are regulations or suggestions on how much fish you should consume from the ocean, especially fish like tuna that are at, at top or the predators in the ocean because of that bioaccumulation of mercury and uh, mercury compounds in their uh, flesh uh, because the mercury level at, at here is very, very small. Uh, but once it gets to the fish, it's to the point where it's becoming harmful. And once it comes to humans, then it, then if you eat a significant amount of fish, that will cause um, even a larger accumulation in your tissue. All right, so honeybees. So we have uh, a decrease in the honeybee population. This is really important because honeybees are responsible for 80% of the insect pollination uh, in the world, I think. So um, there is, I can't remember exactly the quote, but something like one out of every three bites of food, that means that one third of the food that you consume is pollinated by honeybees. And if the honeybees were gone, then all of that food would go away as well. Um, and and this, is, this is a big issue. There's biologists that will um, spend their entire life focusing or entire research focusing on uh, what's happening to honeybees and ways to uh, reintroduce wild honeybees into the into the or get wild honeybees to reproduce in a way to sustain populations because it's it's really uh, really a pretty significant issue all right we have the uh, overconsumption here or over exploitation for the o and that has to do with either poaching or uh, using animals for pets or whatever. And the biggest part here is the prevention piece is to research and educate and then also provide economic incentives to the alternative. So we have a, a big issue with poaching in Africa of rhinoceroses and um, elephants. And if we can educate the population there uh, to use that land and those ecosystems for ecotourism or other economically profitable endeavors, then we can shift the focus of that area from poaching to those other kinds of alternatives. So there's a lot of different kinds of education programs that happen in Africa to try and make that happen. Um, yeah, so disturbing picture of a rhinoceros with its horns cut off. Uh, this is the idea here that individuals matter. So this is a, a pretty important focus of the year that individuals do make a difference. And this is a specific scientist that convinced uh, poachers to preserve their rhinoceros and then also this horn-billed bird to um, lead uh, that idea of an ecotourism or have that uh, ecotourism industry there. So many of those poachers now lead these ecotourism groups as opposed to killing them. And this is, it's important to say that, that this ecotourism concept is a sustainable way of maintaining an economic uh, uh, growth where when you poach something like this and you, and you hunt them to extinction, then once that resource is gone, then you don't have any uh, way to make money from that. So shifting to an economic or uh, sustainable way of economic development. All right, there's Professor, there's the horned bill, um, or the rhinoceros horned bill bird. Actually, is that right? Okay, so um, I apologize. Just to go back, 
uh, the scientists didn't protect rhinoceroses. It protected this rhinoceros horn-billed bird, so a specific bird. All right, and there it is. We have then um, idea of bushmeat and uh, poaching or hunting for bushmeat. And bushmeat in its most gener generic definition is any kind of wild game meat. So if you're a hunter and you go out and hunt deer and you consume that meat, technically that is bushmeat. Now when we talk about bushmeat in more of a, a, a general way, I guess, or a, a more lay term, we think about um, African uh, indigenous peoples or indigenous pe peoples in Australia that go out and hunt uh, wild animals, um, things like gorillas and other types of, I, I guess we call them exotic meats. So we have a, a quite a bit more hunters and um, uh, exotic meat restaurants and places like that that are, are leading to an increase in the amount of bushmeat that's being hunted, So especially in Africa. And, and this has led, one of the reasons why some diseases can uh, transition from um, an animal to a human is through consuming the flesh. And so that is an issue with HIV and Ebola. All right. Uh, in the last section, how can we protect things? And this is kind of the, the good news. This is the good stuff here. And we have uh, two different treaties and or national laws that have been signed that we'll talk about. These are international ones. And we have also the Endangered Species Act that we'll talk about. The CITES project is signed by 172 countries, and the United States is included in this. However, a lot of countries that are um, that that deal in exotic animals and poaching are not part of this treaty in, in West Africa, for example. So that's that's kind of a problem. But this then this limits the trade of any kind of endangered species for any reason, whether that's the animal itself, the hide, or or ivory or, or whatever it is, that's what prevents those kind of trades. And um, every once in a while you hear about like a huge shipment of uh, endangered birds that um, were found and being taken into custody because of their transportation across uh, in, or international boundaries. All right, we have the Convention of Biological Diversity, which focuses on preserving ecosystems. Now, the book doesn't give a whole lot of details to this. I don't actually know a lot of details of how this works, uh, but the idea here is that we focus on preserving the ecosystems and not just the endangered species themselves. And this has been ratified by 190 countries in the world. However, the United States has not ratified this one, and that's kind of the big issue here. Um, to give you an, ex an idea, there's like 196 countries in the world total. All right, we have the Endangered Species Act, which a lot of biologists call the most, or the, the biggest piece of successful legislator related to conservation efforts in history. And it was first established in 1973 and then amended in these years. And it has identified specific endangered species and I guess internationally uh, to try and work on ways to bring them back from extinction um, or from their endangered status. So that's the overall goal. And now because of this, it limits what you can do to those species as well as to the ecosystems to where they live. And so critics say that there's already enough regulations in place. If you know you want to build the development or go log in an area and they find some random uh, endangered owl, then that that area, that habitat automatically gets habitat or gets protected and then they can't develop it however they want it to develop it. And so um, a lot of a lot of corporations and industries get irritated and upset with this act. Now, on the other side, we have um, uh, something that's in place that is working and has is bringing back species from extinction. Not enough, but it is it is working. So we have then the different places that are part of it. Uh, so here's the the overall law, um, and then the amount of species that are listed. Now I think. 42 were listed in 1973 and 1,370 are listed in 2010. And so that's also another 
another critic point is that we're not removing species from the list, we're just adding to it. And um, the problem is that we, you know, when we try to preserve these species, that's a very slow process. Um, and what we can do in order to bring them back from extinction. Uh, we have removed several species from the list, just not very many. Um, we are, are working on different ways to help um, improve the uh, conservation efforts related to this act. All right, picture of endangered species stuff. 1903, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, he developed a wildlife refuge for uh, a particular crane, I think, uh, the whooping crane. No, it was a pelican, um, a brown, the brown pelican. So this is the first U.S. federal wildlife refuge. And so we have a lot of these different wildlife refugees now, uh, and these are areas where these animals are protected. And we could use, we could get more of them, and some ideas are abandoned military lands. Uh, and whether or not those could be used for wildlife refuge, refuges. All right, we have gene banks and botanical gardens and zoos and things like that. So the idea here is to preserve the species in some kind of a controlled environment, so whether that be through a, a gene or a seed bank or through a zoo um, or botanical garden. And the, it's, it's important to understand that the goal of all of these places is to... Uh, Get a large enough population where they can be reduced, uh, can be put back into the, released in the wild, wild and things like seed banks protect seeds of endangered uh, plants, and then those plants could be reintroduced into areas where they are native. Uh, zoos then use strategies like egg pulling and captive breeding to get a population large enough to put them back into the wild. Now. The, so here's you now there's the goal ultimately releasing and reintroducing populations in the wild but there is limited space and funds and there's also a lot of uh, drawbacks for example for seed banks you need to have uh, a huge area that is um, refrigerated or, or below freezing temperature so a lot of these places are built into um, uh, harsh habitats like the Antarctic uh, so that they can have a place where they can be naturally cooled um, but what happens if a fire comes through there and wipes everything out, all of the different species that you've been trying to save all go extinct at the same time because of the loss of the seeds. Um, so there's, there's the problem. All right, uh, we have the precautionary principle, which we'll bring up several times this year. So this is huge. This is a big point. This is based off of the concept of better safe than sorry really. And so the, the idea here is that if we have enough evidence to suggest there's a problem, we should act as if there is a problem. And so, um, I, yeah, like I said, it's, it's based off of that, that better safe than sorry concept. All right. Uh, the three big ideas. All right, uh, that was a little bit longer than normal, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize for the, no the noise in the background. Uh, apparently, there's some construction going on in the storeroom. So uh, I hope this was helpful.